Yeah, so my name is Ryan Kidd. I did a PhD in physics at the University of Queensland studying quantum chaos and ultra cold atoms. Uh, during that PhD, I was uh, involved increasingly more in AI safety, like just, just following some of the research in this field. Uh, I ran some like, like local courses uh, as well. Like we discussed, I uh, had a discussion group for the precipice, a bunch of other things like this. I uh, did a few work trials during the last year of my PhD as well um, at various like AI safety research organizations. And eventually, I actually ended up in the first, uh, among, among other things, in the first cohort of this program, Starry Mats. There's only five of us that made it through to um, the final in-person research stage. And uh, so I worked a bit with like Evan Hubinger, who's now at Anthropic, uh, and this guy, John Wentworth, who is just an independent researcher. Um, and yeah, I, I did a bit of research on things I thought were important at the time, uh, but I, I pretty abruptly switched into, because uh, I was talking with the guys who ran this program back then, Oliver and Victor, uh, Oliver Zhang now is, uh, works at the Center for AI Safety at Dan Hendricks, which published the case letter, which was uh, pretty cool recently. Um, and yeah, and they, they, were, they were really excited to bring me on board to run the program. And so I, I joined in, so it was, it was December 2021 when I like, uh, was in the program myself through to February. And yeah, and around February 2022, I uh, started co-leading the program. They brought me on as a co-director and I helped uh, spin up the program. We brought in Christian Smith as well. It's another co-director, Victor and I, Oliver left to help found Case of Dan. And we, we had a 30 person cohort in the program with a variety of mentors in uh, summer 2022. Uh, those mentors were, in addition to Evan Hubinger, who's like the, the first and primary mentor. We, uh, we also had John Wentworth. We had uh, Alex Gray, then of OpenAI. Uh, we had, and William Saunders, also of OpenAI, was involved. Uh, and we ended up with um, Beth Barnes, uh, who was at that point not yet at ARC Evals, where she is now the, she is the director of ARC Evals. Um, and yeah, and several other researchers. And, and this, this rapidly grew into a, like another, a 58 person cohort in winter, 2022, uh, 23, uh, and then a 60 person cohort in summer of 2023. So it's been a quite a large uh, program for a few cohorts. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's no easy task organizing this. And along the way, we uh, also bootstrapped this new London-based office hub for AI safety called the London Initiative for Safe AI, or LISA, named after the famous computer. Um, so yeah, so, so I'm, and I'm a director on the board of LISA as well, because it was kind of bootstrapped out of the MATS uh, extension program that we, uh, we basically, we basically uh, there were some scholars who wanted to continue working, and so we endorsed them for uh, further funding. We've held two extension programs so far and are holding a third currently. And so after our primary, um, so Matt, Matt's is effectively uh, a summer or winter like research fellowship program. So we, we, uh, we basically like help connect uh, independent researchers with mentorship uh, and funding opportunities. And we hold a seminar program for them in Berkeley, California, twice a year. Uh, so that's, that's two months long and there's a preceding one month online training program. Um, but then after that, there's an opportunity for this four month, up to four month extension program. Um, that we try and offer people. And that can happen uh, occasionally. People will go to London for uh, visa purposes and also because there's a growing AI safety community in London. Of course, all the scaling labs, that's DeepMind, Anthropic, OpenAI have offices in London now. Um, and of course, DeepMind has always been in London, but OpenAI and Anthropic recently uh, moved, built some campuses there. Uh, so, th so it's like a pretty hot place to be is now as well, the UK AI task force and all sorts of things. So the London Initiative for Safe AI or LISA uh, that we help spin up, um, yeah, that, that basically has five uh, member organizations. So that's Matt's, uh, this ARENA, arena.education is their website. It's sort of like a research upskilling program based on Redwood Research's uh, MLAB curriculum and, and Jacob Hilton's um, uh, deep learning curriculum for AI safety. And so that they run periodically, they're sort of like uh, a MATS program, except for more uh, research engineering. And they're focused on developing the skills, whereas MATS is more focused on expressing the skills through research. But we think they're great. Uh, there's also uh, Apollo Research, founded by one of our alumni, Marius Hopan, uh, and actually with a lot of our alumni employed as well. Uh, Leap Labs, founded by another alumni, Jessica Rumbelow. Uh, they, she and uh, Matthew Watkins, another alumni, they did the Solid Gold Magic Heart thing while in our program, if you recall that. Uh, in the last year, it was quite a famous, got a Vice article. Uh, they found some like weird anomalous tokens that caused GPT-3 to output just, just insane things. Um, yeah, it's quite an interesting piece of safety research, I think.
So yeah, that's kind of roughly my background. Oh, I also uh, recently was was appointed a Mana Fund regrantor, which is so Mana Fund um, is a program by Manifold Markets, which is a great website. Uh, it's like a prediction market for all sorts of things. You bet fake money, uh, and it can cash out in. You can, you can buy more fake money, but you can't cash it out in real money. So it's not like illegal, you know, <laughs> with the U.S. gambling restrictions. Um, but you can actually cash it out in charitable donations. So there's some incentive there, and so they they put together a. Um, a re-granting program as well, uh, which is where basically if you have a pot of money and you don't have time to know where to spend it, but you but you you think you can you can find people whose judgment you trust to spend it for you, you might form a re-granting program. Um, and so because of my connection of Matt's and all the, the the burgeoning AI safety talent that passes through the program, uh, I haven't uh, yet made my first grant, but I'm um, I've interviewed a lot of people and I'm like putting together my notes on how to do that. So it's an exciting new uh, opportunity, I think as well. So that's my background. What got you concerned about AI risk? Yeah, so when I was in high school, uh, growing up in the Gold Coast, I was reading a lot of this, this uh, uh, bunch, of, bunch of weird internet forums that thought AI safety was very important. I didn't at the time. I thought it was interesting, um, but I didn't think it was something that would occur in my lifetime, AGI. Uh, I now do. Um, and part of the reason back then that I didn't think it was uh, super likely is I, I just think the field was in a very different state the field of AI. Um, but, but even at that time, I was like, I'm going to go to university, I'm going to study cognitive neuroscience. Ended up going to UQ instead of ANU, um, which I think had, had the, the program I was more interested in, but uh, for various reasons, I went to UQ. And I found I didn't really like the practice of biology or chemistry very much. And there wasn't a, a straight, so I did a biophysics major, it wasn't a straight pathway. So I ended up uh, kicking it around maths and physics for my university degree. This kind of just turned into a PhD naturally. Um, it, was, it was great, I had a great time. Uh, but I think during my PhD, I kind of woke up a little bit and realized that, oh, wow, this AI safety stuff is like kind of pretty important. And so like when I was in high school, I was like really big into Amnesty International and climate activism and stuff. Uh, and and, and the, the climate part of that uh, at least persisted throughout university. You know, it was like going to all the climate rallies, um, you know, just I was uh, involved in the Greens Party, um, helping them out a bunch in Australia and uh, in, in, in some of the seats in Brisbane. Um, a lot of door knocking and so, so on, you know, because I was like, climate change is just where it's at. It's super important. We're going to fix this problem. Um, a, lot, a lot of student activism as well I was involved in. Uh, but but somewhere along that way, I, I kind of became like, I started thinking like, ooh, what, what, what's this like effective altruism kind of thing? And I discovered that in my PhD. Uh, and there was the, the particular schema they used to evaluate, you know, impactful stuff is to say the impact, the tractability, and the neglectedness. Um, or sorry, importance, tractability, neglectedness, and that's that's an order like, what is the size of of the uh, the thing you're trying to move with the lever, right? Tractability is like I don't know how amenable to being moved is the thing, right? Neglectedness is like, are there other people pulling on this lever, or is it just you? Uh, and so it seemed on all three of these fronts, climate change uh, was just not the thing I should be focusing on. Um, uh, even, of course, this was always adjacent to my PhD as well. So I was doing a physics PhD. So it was like, this is more like a, an activism thing. So I was like, I can't, you know, be a scientist and work on this. There's, there's like, uh, obviously people can. <laughs> but um, for some reason, I just didn't find that the, the kind of science involved in that as, as interesting as the kind of like maths and physics that I was doing. Um, I mean, radiative forcing, very interesting physics, but also like atmospheric chemistry. And it's, it didn't really seem like the kind of... Uh, the kind of research that I would want to do personally. Um, but then like, okay, so I had, had a spell where I was like involved in my local effective altruism group and I was very interested in uh, nuclear risk, right? Because I read some papers by Robach, Toon, Ku, et al., these people um, who did research into like nuclear winter, nuclear autumn, like involving US, Russia nuclear exchanges um, and involving, you know, India, Pakistan nuclear exchanges, smaller, but like still quite devastating and like the effects on global hunger that would be caused by like a nuclear autumn and, or a nuclear winter. Cool. Um, but then I like, kind of like, during this time, I also discovered AI safety. And I think the book, The Precipice by Toby Ward was pretty pivotal here. Um, and reading that, I got a sense that there was a lot more uh, reason to be afraid of this problem in like the next few decades than I thought. Um, so my, my journey has kind of been one of like, seeing like being very motivated to fix large problems uh at least like socially um and then kind of realizing that my career could have an impact in this way as well 
rather than just you know through my like private activism and then separate we think like reprioritizing among the kinds of uh kind of person um, like the kinds of the kind of interventions that are most important for uh, causing positive change in the world and i think ai risk is currently where it's at i think that we are on track to see something resembling artificial general intelligence in 10 to 20 years um, possibly sooner probably not much longer and i think this is pretty scary personally like uh the metaculous estimate of of 2031 seems pretty reasonable that's a forecasting website um, where you can go and forecast and yeah i i, I don't have strong reason to think otherwise than that and I've talked to a lot of uh, very competent people, and I've tried to build my own opinions on this by reading a lot of literature on the subject. Um, everything from like scaling laws, papers. So as you add more data or compute, uh, what do you get out the other end in terms of capabilities? Uh, through to like arguments against language models being an efficient controller or central brain for future AI agents. Um, and I, I just like find the literature pretty persuasive that in fact language models could reasonably be these central controllers for generally powerful AI agents. And I find uh, the literature discussing uh, why people would be persuaded to build systems like this pretty compelling as well. And I think I see a lot of evidence in the world of corporations um, and individuals, you know, moving forward in on producing technologies that have social ramifications uh, before they're considered safe. And I think that this is a very lucrative technology. It's the most lucrative technology ever. And it's, and it's also militarily, uh, like, advantageous. It's like the most militarily advantageous technology ever, potentially. Um, so if, if this is possible, uh, I think we, we will see just even more than the current massive vested interests continue moving in this direction. Um, and I don't expect, by default, it will be as safe as I would like. What specific aspects of AI, such as its use by humans or the technology itself, concern you the most? especially considering that several AI experts, for instance, Joshua Bengio, Jeffrey Hinton, and more recently, Douglas Hofstadter, they have shifted their views towards believing that transformative AI is imminent and potentially hazardous due to more recent developments in the field. Yeah, so I think there's many plausible, I'll call them attack vectors, by which humans or AI systems could harm humans, human civilization. I also think there's many reasons why systems would either spontaneously, which I'll call accident risk, or um, through through like a human agency, uh, which I'll call misuse risk, be used to cause these things. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential to raise the um, the kind of the the like what would they call the unilateralist curse, right? To cause situations like this uh, with AI technologies. For instance, a uh, unilateralist curse is where one individual, if they defect or do something bad, it can cause an outsized impact on the whole of society. Um, and there are several mechanisms by which I think AI technologies can cause this kind of damage. One of those is uh, through novel pathogens. Um, so if there's a paper out of MIT by Kevin Esfeldt and his lab um, where they talk about AI democratizing access to dual-use biotechnology, there's some pretty scary conclusions there, so I recommend reading that cyber weapons uh, so recently there's been uh, so i don't know if you've heard of worm gpt it's a tool based on uh, the open source gpt uh, j model out of Eleuther ai and this worm gpt tool allows like hackers to who previously would not have been able to write um, great code you know to hack people's computers to like very readily build botnet armies or you know uh, like like engineer information out of people um, so that's that's like that's a whole issue uh, third, I think human manipulation. I think like we already saw with uh, the Russian interference in the U.S. election, uh, that last election, that botnets were like, well, chat, chatbot armies basically can cause political swings and trolling and disinformation campaigns are very powerful. Uh, there was this recent case of this Chinese businessman who with, was like, subjected to deep fakes of uh, his, his, yeah, his loved ones asking for ransom money and all this other stuff. It was crazy. And they, they, he lost $600,000 as a result. And so I think that, that these deep fakes will be more and more prevalent. Um, and I think that like our info security, while I think the only way to protect against uh, very powerful AI systems who are, that are trying to cause uh, cybersecurity hazards is to have better cybersecurity, probably via AI power systems. 
Uh, and I don't think we're there yet. I think there's going to be this um, offense-defense trade-off, right, that favors offense for quite a while in cybersecurity. And for biosecurity, it might always favor offense uh, until we get like very good monitoring, uh, like, like the pandemic bill that was tried to pass through Congress uh, uh, last year. But yeah, so there's, there's, there's ways in which I think AI technologies make it easier to cause harm, and I'm quite worried about these. Uh, and in terms of like, there, there's also other risks, there's accident risks. Uh, I think people are going to be very motivated to build general purpose agents. Uh, certainly there's a huge amount of research on this now. Uh, this is massive, like, like in the field of AI, agents are where it's at, right? Systems that can uh, choose from a series of options according to some objective, they can plan and strategize, they can act in the world, they have situational awareness, they know what they're a model because this is useful to know so that you can interact with people and you can accomplish tasks. Um, and people are very motivated to build these agents. Uh, we already see the first iteration, admittedly pretty weak, but I think soon very powerful with auto GPT uh, and baby AGI and these other tools people have built, out, which basically have um, some scaffolding around a base language model API, like GPT-4 API, and you can get these things to, uh, you give them access to certain tools, perhaps you train them to use certain tools potentially. Um, uh, that could be like symbolic logic en engines or calculators or you know, web browser, you, like, like they can query things in web browsers, etc. Um, and perhaps they have access to a scratch pad where they can write down thoughts. Perhaps they use chain of thought uh, prompting where they like write their thoughts out loud, refer to them and append them back into the next prompt. Um, and these kind of tools I suspect are going to be quite powerful soon. Uh, and I think there's a lot of economic incentive to build these tools because as we know, humans are agents and humans are pretty good at accomplishing human labor. <laughs> And I think the next generation, uh, or maybe in two generations, say auto GPT-6, will be very powerful uh, and will be able to accomplish a lot of human labor. And I'm worried about the kind of accident risks that could result if you build these tools that are powerful, but we haven't specified sufficiently what they should be doing. Uh, in particular, I think that it is not guaranteed that when you build agents, even if you think you know what you're doing, that they work the way you intend. In particular, we have no idea, <laughs> you know, how a lot of deep learning systems function at a very basic level. We don't know the kind of circuitry they implement. We don't even know if they're like truly not conscious or something, you know. Uh, it's, it's just this huge, scary unknown. And we just keep building bigger systems that are more capable uh, and that we have even less idea about how they operate fundamentally. State-of-the-art large language models are notably opaque, but it's great to see a lot of attention on interpretability research. What areas of this research do you find the most exciting? Yeah, so I mean, interpretability is a, a broad uh, spectrum. I, uh, well, let me give my definition of interpretability. Uh, so interpretability is like taking something that is like a black box, it's a mystery. You, you put in like cubes and out, it outputs spheres or something, right? And you want to work out why and how, or like, how does it do that? Like, what, what is the actual process inside the thing? Now, if your box is very big, right, and there's a lot going on inside, there's a lot of widgets whirring in there, uh, interpretability can be very hard. If you can only look at the inputs and outputs, then it's almost impossible. Um, maybe you can construct, maybe you can like, uh, construct a vast array of possible inputs and study how the outputs change, and from that kind of work out, hmm, what well, seems to cause it, you can infer the kind of thing that's going inside. This is one mechanism people have tried. Um, I think this is, there, there are ways that this might succeed, but I think mostly this is probably going to fail. Uh, the, 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 the box is too big. There are too many possible inputs. It's just too complicated. So you got to open up the box, right? You get to look what's inside. But what's inside is this mess of alien wiring, right? It's just like this vastly alien brain. It's not even like the human brain that we are starting to like see, oh, there's some regions that do this. And, you know, it's like even more weird. The advantage is it's not literally a brain and we can see all the, the neurons, right? Like if they're, su they're laid out, they're super easy, it's like the best dissection ever. But they're not organized as well. Um, and we don't even know uh, what, we're, what we're looking for because in some ways, like the kind of operations that, that neural networks perform, we don't have this like, we, we don't know for sure whether they're like simple heuristics, like pattern matching, or they're more complicated circuits. Uh, 
So what we're looking for on two, is on two levels. One, we, uh, if, we, if we like have access to the weights, we can search at the very small level for circuits that represent like simple types of operations. Uh, so there's a lot of literature out on this, and I recommend uh, looking up the literature by Neil Nanda, uh, Chris Ola, the Anthropic uh, team, um, Tristan Hume, etc. There's there's quite a, there's quite a few interesting papers. A lot of our research in Mats is focused on this. Neil Nanda is a Mats mentor. He's currently at DeepMind, um, and yeah, a bunch of scholars have just published interesting stuff. Like Hoagie Cunningham recently has a paper out with Lee Sharkey, another Mats mentor. Um, Bilal, Shabtai, and other alumni. You can find some interesting research here. I think this is uh, very promising. I think it's going to be hard to scale, but I think it's possible. There's a paper out of OpenAI where they basically label every neuron in GPT-2 small with GPT-4. Uh, so it hypothesizes what each neuron does based on like a bunch of tests that they conduct using the language model. So they can do this at scale. They can, they can like, you know, parallelize this. Um, it's not perfect. They haven't solved the problem. But this is maybe an inroads to solving interpretability at a large level. Is work out kind of... Uh, so we have certain techniques for doing this kind of mechanistic interpretability. Uh, one of which is called causal scrubbing. Which is where you like isolate uh, particular neurons that you think are interesting. Uh, or like sections of neurons. And you kind of vary the inputs and outputs. Or vary the inputs and then check the outputs in a way such that you can... Uh, uh, you can also like ablate other neurons. You can like uh, you know change the internal relationships between things to see what what uh, causes outputs to change and what doesn't. And eventually, you can construct a pretty uh, pretty good probabilistic explanation of what's happening there. This takes a lot of effort for very small uh, neurons in the whole scheme of things. Um, this is hard to scale, but it's possible we could scale it with language models. Uh, there's other approaches. Uh, like actually, I, I will say one of the most interesting findings. Um, uh, from mechanistic interpretability is the existence of induction heads and in-context learning where you have this like uh, special kind of circuit within a model that like is very very specifically like a function of other uh, inputs that you like might have so it like kind of scans over the inputs and it like it kind of it's, it's, it's like uh, like a general function on inputs in your text sample in your prompt that like does some special kind of operation. Uh, there's also all sorts of other interpretability work. So Colin Burns, now in OpenAI, published interesting research uh, about eliciting latent knowledge, which is the term uh, developed by, uh, coined by Paul Cristiano of the Alignment Research Center, one of the, the founders of Reinforcement Learning from Human Feedback and a fantastic research scientist uh, for AI safety. Uh, but Colin Burns did a paper where he basically trained a language model to be uh, more internally consistent. So he's like, like and truthful. Uh, and also, like with like, had a whole data set. It's like, oh, are all cats uh, something like uh, cats have four legs? And it's like, what are is like, are what's an animal with four legs? Cat, yes or no? You know, just like the kind of uh, if A implies B, and B like does B imply A? Like questions that are that are uh, bidirectional, right? Um, and yeah, so he's like, he trained it to be truthful and to be like more certain about things, and this actually improved the model's accuracy. Uh, pretty. Yeah, pretty. Yeah, but like, there's a, there's a bunch of ways you can like you can uh, use linear probes. You can like uh, try and like elicit model um, descriptions of its own output for interpretability as well. So that's like maybe uh, some black box methods that might pan out. Um, there's some papers here like models mostly know what they know. There's one such paper that studies this. Um, yeah, there's a whole field of literature here. I would re I would recommend investigating. There's a particular paper, if you're interested in this, that summarizes a lot of this, and that's uh, by Sam Bowman, professor at NYU. It's called Eight Things You Should Know About Language Models. Further on interpretability, let's touch on AI self-interpretability. Simplistically, the idea is to reduce the risk of unintended mutation. It may be important for an AI to understand its own models. So now, if an AI doesn't have a robust inside view, a causal operational understanding of its own models, even if it wanted to be human friendly, how can it reliably predict whether an update to its models would produce safe and beneficial outcomes with no unintended side effects? So I guess I question your premise that AI is like current, like I guess current language models are sort of what I would say on the cusp of situational awareness. So there's some like interesting work out of Owen Evans lab with uh, some math scholars as well, uh, another mentor in our program that like looks at this concept of situational awareness. Like do language models realize that they're language models, you know? Um, certainly you can prompt language models, say you're a language model, and then it'll like be, it'll, like, be internally consistent, be like, oh yes, I'm a language model, or run that simulation. This is not the same thing as having actual situational awareness. 
Uh, I definitely don't think it's impossible for language models to gain this. I think this is the kind of thing that you could you could relatively easily, um, yeah, like I, I say relatively easily, but I'm like imagining uh, the next few generations of models that are trained to be agents or something. I do think that situational awareness, like at least in the sense of, oh, if they're planning to do stuff, this is something that models might uh, be able to gain. So the, the GPT-4 system card, uh, which fe featured um, some studies by ARC evals, so you can find them online. Uh, and they um, also, yeah, there were Matt's mentors as well, Beth Barnes and Lawrence Chan. Uh, and so some of the work that they, they that their scholars uh, and, and the organization uh, was involved with was, was studying the properties of um, GPT-4 before it was publicly released, studying its capabilities. Uh, and so famously, you know, they like set up a scaffolding for the model. They were studying self-exfiltration. Can the model hack its way out of a box, right? Um, and so while the while they, like there's no evidence so far that language models have that level of situational awareness, uh, the kinds of things that are required for this, language models are disturbingly good at. And so that was that famous uh, report in the New York Times and other places, result they found, where um, you know, they got GPT-4 to like, like had to complete a CAPTCHA, you know, to, to get a web server to like maybe copy itself onto some web server. And so it hired uh, a task rabbit to read the CAPTCHA for it, you know what I mean? Which, by the way, CAPTCHA is not going to survive. Like, already uh, multimodal models like G Gato and stuff, I I'm not sure how good they are at CAPTCHAs, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they're very easy very soon. You know, I, I think CAPTCHAs going to have to get vanishingly hard, especially as AI models are surpassing humans and like uh, all sorts of different types of image recognition and audio processing tasks even. Uh, actually, I'm not sure about the audio processing, uh, maybe for certain types of sound. Um, like, there's that result... Uh, uh, where like you know, there was this side channel attack on finding people's passwords from like like they use like models, not language models, but models to um, from keystroke sounds over a computer microphone to work out people's passwords. That's how good you can expect AI systems to be. Um, that's crazy. I think it was at an AGI conference in 2016 or 17. Uh, Dalip George, who's an AI researcher, had developed AI that could reliably pass capture tests so it's been going on for quite some time it's really interesting yeah i don't think it's like a super hard problem uh i think also like so there was palisade research uh, run by jeffrey laddish another matt's mentor uh in the last summer program some of their scholars built um one they built uh, a scaffolding such that gpt4 could hack an unpatched windows machine for hack the box challenge like on its own, no prompting except for at the start, just like, hey, hack this, hack this machine, and they like little scaffolding so it would pipe into Bash, and then pipe the Bash output back, and it like tries a bunch of exploits, finds ones that work, works, and then is able to execute, which is crazy. Other things they did, uh, they they trained the safety restrictions out of Llama two. That's Meta's model. Um, took them eight hundred dollars in like two weeks. Nothing, you know. This is like these are like undergrads. Well, one of them was an undergrad. Um, Crazy. Uh, third thing, built a social engineering Discord bot that would just like read people's Discord profiles and like custom engineer um, automatically without any prompting, right? We just go through and do this. Custom engineer spear phishing attacks to steal their information by ha striking up a conversation with them and establishing rapport over shared interests. Crazy. Yeah, I feel like we're on the cusp of transformative AI. You mentioned situational awareness before. Does this include an internal awareness such as causal and operational awareness of itself? So there's this, there's this hypothetical concept called gradient hacking, um, which I believe is coined by Evan Hubinger, um, one, of the, one of the mass mentors, um, and discussed by, extensively by him and Richard Noe and other people on the Alignment Forum. Uh, which is a website where a lot of these researchers write blog posts and discuss things. Uh, uh, so gradient hacking, which is pretty wild, right? Is like, what if a model during training wakes up to itself, realizes it's in training? Here's an example of how it might realize it's in training. It says like, hmm, uh, what it like, can I like, uh, I don't know, like I'm learning all this stuff about the world. Uh, can I like act in the world? Like, or uh, I don't know, just like, like, Ask, like, ask some like complicated problem that is like very hard to simulate. Like, I don't know, what is the weather going to look like in 10 days or something? Or, or something that would like, like you'd ha you, you could, if you were, uh, 
I don't know, just some, some problem that maybe is like easier to actually like cause to happen in the real world versus to simulate. Um, and, and if there's like, if it's exploring like a simulated environment or something, say like theory of reinforcement learning protocol, uh, and it like encounters a situation that seems like kind of relatively implausible to it based on the information it knows about the real world, um, and or perhaps it tries to do something that is like uh, kind of hard to simulate or it tries to like, I don't know, uh, yeah, it just notices weird irregularities, um, then it might discover, realize this in training. Um, yeah, I think, I think like this is, this is, this gets kind of weird sci-fi by this point, but like it might, gradient hacking is like this method by which the model like learns this in training and then like tries to influence the gradient updates that are happening to it such that it's like doing brain surgery on itself, right? Rather than like just letting, uh, you know, itself be shaped. So one way that it could, one way reason I might want to do this is what if it externally acquires goals through training, perhaps proxies for the goals that you want it to have, but it develops some other goals and it's then it coheres upon those goals because they're not disfavored by the training signal, but in fact, they're not the same as what you want to instill in it. Um, so this concept is like reward is not the optimization target. Reward from an outside reinforcement learning protocol is a chisel that shapes the model's cognition, but it is not, you're not like imprinting exactly what you want. You're chiseling away. And you might build something different. And if a model has goals and it realizes it can in fact like influence its training process, perhaps by making its uh, abilities fail hard, if you try and edit the part of its brain that is like, don't be deceptive, but it's suddenly like, oh, I'm really bad at math now. So you're like, okay, well, undo that change. You know what I mean? Um, and if it's doing this in a really opaque way, then you can't do a lot about it. Uh, other things it might do, there's certain kinds of um, scenarios. We might want to put models in situations where they generate their own uh, like situations to train on later. Um, so Richard No talks a bit about this in the alignment problem from a deep learning perspective. Um, so there's like certain types of uh, uh, setups, like actor critic setups or something. Um, where you might, models might be incentivized to uh, generate their, like, like to explore parts of their environment in a way that like shapes the kinds of rewards they encounter, which then shapes the way that they are changed. If it can predict what the rewards are, it might avoid certain areas of exploration that would cause it to be updated in ways you don't want, that it doesn't want rather, and like choose preferentially other ways and steer its own cognition. Uh, I think these are like plausible, uh, I'm less concerned about these than you train a model and then you deploy it and then it executes some sort of treacherous turn or uh, is misused later. Um, but I'm certainly somewhat concerned about gradient hacking. On AI capability growth, what is the likelihood of a sharp left turn in AI? That is a sudden punctuated increase in its capability as opposed to mostly continuous and smoothly gradual development over time. Well, we see these sudden punctuated increasing capability all the time. Like it is the norm rather than the exception. Uh, like you, you just like, you just see these properties emerge with scale. Like uh, the loss curve just keeps going down as you train models. Um, but suddenly you'll like, you'll notice something like some grokking phenomenon. You're familiar with grokking? It's a recent paper, Rohan Shah et al. at a DeepMind, um, they talk about this phenomenon of grokking where uh, you train like, let's say you get a language model and you train to be like good at modular addition right? Adding numbers together. Um, and for a while, it just memorizes the things you've trained. It's like you can train it on like one plus one is you know, two, because um, language models are bad at arithmetic for some reason, by default. Um, but you, you train it one plus one equals two, and then you query it later. What's one plus one? Two. It knows. But if you ask it, what's one plus three? Doesn't, doesn't know, maybe. This is, a, this is a constructed example. But the point is, it memorizes the training set until so it hits a point where it suddenly stops memorizing and, and its ability on the test set just massively spikes up like a phase transition. Uh, this phenomenon is called grokking. Uh, and this, this is like, this is something we expect to happen. Certainly like regular properties of model performance seem to only emerge at scale. Like as you build models bigger, as you train them longer, they just like get robustly better at things. And suddenly like you test them on a new domain that the smaller model just didn't work at and it just spontaneously worked at it, even though you didn't try to make it any better. Um, just like all sorts of crazy tests, you know, like all the, the battery of tests that you, people have thrown at GPT-4. It's just like, wow, we didn't train it to be good at these things. Uh, we just like trained it to be like on a larger corpus of text and made it larger. And suddenly it's like acing like bar exams for law, like legal students. Uh, it's like 
out like it's it's, it's like I don't know um, incredibly better at code you know uh, we didn't try to make it so much better at code we just it just is so there's something that does seem to emerge at scale and I think that uh, especially if people fine tune these models on special data sets to be better at code to be better at symbolic reasoning or other things they will just they will display even more properties at scale is the growth of AI capabilities particularly in large language models typically predictable or do new abilities suddenly emerge unpredictably and possibly even abruptly I mean I think the norm is that models will grow in capability unpredictably um, certainly I expect scaling laws to persist uh, for quite a while um, that's like we make the model bigger uh, then it just its performance increases um, but like like you said, like uh, I don't know. I can't predict uh, with with certainty when it will. I don't know. Language model will first be able to. I don't know. Run a company or something. You know, something crazy like that. Uh, I certainly think that like people could deliberately try and make models better and get some gains. I also think you'll get a lot. Like a lot of the the gains come from just making models bigger. Um, I don't know how to predict when certain capabilities emerge. I think that is possibly one of the scariest things is we don't know what's going to happen. I think we're in a weird world. I think we're in a world where the best path towards safe AI might root through AI. Um, AI research assistants. Uh, I think that this is probably the, the median mechanism by which we, in this current world, get safe AI. Uh, is if, say, like OpenAI's super alignment plan succeeds. Um, which involves things like scalable oversight. Yeah, you know, it's getting models to inspect other models and you know debate each other and hopefully have a human judge who understands it at the end, right? Uh, it's about like you know having um, this kind of like GPT four labeling all the nodes of GPT two. You know, um, yeah, it's about like shaping the kind of training uh, you you put models under so you get the right stuff. It's about having kind of checks and balances and independent auditors who are assessing these these systems like Archivals and maybe Apollo Research. Uh, it's about doing a lot of fundamental research that hopefully builds into something like the, the mechanistic interpretability. Um, I think that if we were like trying, like the old kind of model of how to build AI systems like symbolic logic engines, good old fashioned AI is just, is not going to be the mechanism by which we build AI. I think the bitter lesson is, is pretty salient and true here, which is like things just get better with scale, you know? Um, and Yeah, I suspect that uh, if we can't slow down AI progress in a unilateral way, um, then our best hope is going to come from uh, safety standards, um, labs being motivated to do the right thing to some extent, uh, and to like make their products safe, um, and from as many academics as possible joining the fight. Uh, people in machine learning, computer science, mathematics, neuroscience, Computational biology, there's the, like just there's vast amounts of, um, of of like backgrounds that come through my program mats that seem like like I don't know literary analysis, uh, just all all over the place. Like and and all these people have different perspectives on the problem that I think are very important. I think there's a huge amount of ethical considerations that we'll have to incorporate uh, into our, our our governance practices. You know, um, so I think there's like just vast amounts of work to be done here, uh, and I'm like. I say like, I should say, I, th I expect the future on average to be like really good. Um, but I'm just scared by like 25% chance, I think personally, of just the future being really terrible and humans being disempowered by AI systems um, of our own creation. And I think that uh, short of somehow everyone slowing down and taking their time and building them safely, uh, we're going to have to contend with like a pretty risky path. Um, yeah. Uh, fund AI safety, you know, get involved. Grassroots movement building, local, lo like just get involved, you know. Uh, read up some of the literature I've mentioned. Read some open philanthropy worldview investigation reports. They're great predictors of when and how AGI might occur. Um, yeah, just like to get engaged with the literature. There's a great course called AGI Safety Fundamentals run by Blue Dot Impact. That's the, the fifth and final organization operating out of Lisa in London. Um, they're great. Their course wonderful um, get involved run a local version at your university 
uh, cr criticize it, like find holes in this, this, this research. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know, you know, consider, consider learning some machine learning. Uh, and in general, like, yeah, just aim for a positive future. <laughs> That's, I should have emphasized that more. I think that the future is probably going to be wonderful. And AI technologies, I think, are actually going to be such an enormously beneficial part of that. Um, but we have to do it right. We have to do it safely. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm about, is about accelerating the development of just a just really positive future for everybody with just robust democratic governance mechanisms um, that just like empower people uh, to, to live better, you know? Mm -hmm.